Hello, Hello and man. welcome. No, no, no. You are you about are to enter the Large K Podcast. What's up, everybody? My name is Kazu, and welcome to Large K Podcast. On this show, I interview bands and artists, and we talk about their music, favorite shows, and how they got to where they're at. For today's show, I had a great talk with Rudy DeAnda. He's a very talented songwriter from Long Beach. He now has two albums under his belt, and he consistently plays shows and have played with many bands in the past. We talked about the new direction he's taking with this project, his last album, Delay Cadaver of a Day, and an advice he would give to a young starting artist. All right, let's get right to it. Here's my interview with Rudy DeAnda. Enjoy. Actually, before, um, what was it called? I, I was doing a little bit of, like you say, you've done like a good amount of interviews. So, like I've done some like research on you and read like a, an LA Weekly uh, article on Rudy Deanda also. And you know, just to get like a little bit of background, um, you could just give me like a little more detail if you if you want to. But so, so you're originally from Compton, but your family moved to Long Beach because because the house burned down from. LA riot was that um, more or less I was born in Watts um, but we uh, quickly moved to Compton um, you know for the first few years of my life oh, okay and uh, you know the LA riots uh, yes consequently we had to move because our house was burned down so we stayed six months in East LA and then eventually my dad found a house out here in Long Beach that was just kind of like I think the major factor there was it was close to the 710 freeway oh, I see and um yeah, um, we ended up in Long Beach out of circumstance in that sense, and but like um, through tragedy comes good things too, and um, as much as unfortunate as the LA riots were, um, in a weird way, like in my personal life, it was cool to uh, like end up in Long Beach. Um, I don't know if I would have ended up in Long Beach if it wasn't for that. No, right, yeah, was it like? That's that's crazy though. So everybody like evacuated like at that moment and like yeah, we just had to evacuate. Yeah. So it was like near Koreatown area. No, mm-hmm. I don't think so. Okay. But I'm like, again, you know, I was so young that I hardly remember the street names. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I want to say like Rosecrans or something. I don't know. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's crazy though. But you know, you ended up in a place where you ended up playing music with like a lot of your friends. So. Yeah, I, it's crazy how uh, one situation could change your life. Yeah. I don't know if I'd be a musician if it wasn't for that. Yeah. Or maybe not as... Wouldn't have been as uh, much access to music where I would have grown up. Yeah. Was was guitar your first instrument? It was. Okay. Yeah. How, how When did you start playing it? I was like 12 or 13. Um, to put it into context, I'll be 29 this month. 
Nothing. Um, but yeah, I, honestly, I, I was just uh, starting to get into rock and roll because um, I grew up on like hip hop and like Bob Marley and stuff like that. Right. Um, like I grew up on like Death Row <laughs> records. Mm -hmm. But then um, I just started to take a liking to a. You know, it's funny because that whole movement of like, you know, it was like Linkin Park and Deftones yeah. and all this stuff where like people are starting to blend hip hop with rock. So I feel like <laughs> that kind of helped in a weird way as a little kid, like exposed me to people playing instruments as opposed to just rapping. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but like, I still listen to Deftones to this day. I don't give a shit what anybody says. That's, <laughs> I love Deftones. Yeah. Um, They're still pretty active. Like, yeah, they are. Yeah. 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 Chino Moreno is one of my favorite singers. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think I just started to listen to like the Beatles, and you know, the John Frusciante was a major player for me to like. I feel like John Frusciante was single-handedly the reason that I decided that I wanted to play guitar. Almost like in a nutshell, right? Just because yeah, yeah. I saw him playing with the Red Hot Chili Peppers and in his own project, and I just it just drew me in. Like I want to be like that guy. Also, you, you so you've seen him solo before too, then? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen him live, but just was familiar the fact that he had solo music. Yeah, because he has so many solo records. Yeah, and they're all. I mean, it's fair to say that you know. Like, I mean, if it wasn't for Red Hot Chili Peppers, I wouldn't have, like, eventually f found out all of his own personal collection of music. Right, yeah. But then, like, The Clash and The Smiths. Love The Clash, and, yeah, The Smiths. Like, um, and all these people start to pop up when you're a kid. You're, you're kind of, like, rummaging through all this music, whether it's embarrassingly, like, you know, it's embarrassing to admit, but whatever, like, you're, sh you're sifting through all this music. And eventually you're going to find something that you like, you know, like, eventually I grew out of certain things, you know, like listening to like Eminem, but, uh, <laughs> but then, you know, here comes David Bowie and here comes Manu Chao and King Crimson and everyone listens to, I mean, at least for me, like, you know, we like kind of like making sure we at least like did our history, right? So like research, like you obviously got to listen to your Led Zeppelins and Pink Floyds and black sabbaths and kind of just get like a base for what you really want i mean that was just what i was doing subconsciously every every kid's doing that you know i was never really into acdc and shit like that yeah i was wondering like because i know i saw your chest tattoo and you have like the smiths written on there is that are they one of your favorite bands uh yeah i mean that was one of the first bands when i was like a freshman in high school where like it was weird, but I felt like I could identify with it. And as as vague as like, a, like a, there's no real specific reason why I like became so attached to it. But at the same time, so do I, many other Mexican people. Mm -hmm. It's just like this weird thing where we just, as we just, I think it's just so cathartic and like a lot of like northern Mexican music and stuff like that is very cathartic. And I don't know, maybe there's like a kinship there. Yeah. But um. I just remember my friend offering me a free tattoo and I was like looking around and I was wondering what am I not going to regret in 15 years? <laughs> so I was like, I am pretty sure that as old as I get in life, I'm not going to like not have a soft spot for the Smiths. Um, and, you know, so I figured that was the one band that I could at least like just calmly like know that I will always at least listen to every once in a while yeah Morse, I mean, Morrissey's extremely popular in Mexico huh yeah he is um, he knows it too and he definitely like takes advantage of it and not in a bad way and like I just think there's like a weird connection there that you know he's done shows where he wraps himself around the Mexican flag yeah yeah that's crazy though actually like the Smiths are one of my favorite bands too and um, yeah I I was wondering, do you happen to have, like, any song that kind of, like, stuck out to you? Like, holy shit, like, this is, this um, is, like, one of my favorites. Yeah. I mean, you, that, that's always a tough one, but I think maybe, like, a, I said, I'll answer it two parts. Like, the first, I like This Night Has Opened My Eyes. Dude, I was thinking the same song. <laughs> out of, like, Love it, it just song. has a little bit of every other Smith's, like, kind of their thing. Has like a slight hit of every like all of their best qualities yeah. all in one song, and it's just like I don't know. It's just such a 
again cathartic heavy song but with a really cool groove yeah. and one of the most underrated rhythm sections in history is you know the rhythm section for the Smith so yeah that Johnny Marr get, Johnny Marr's guitar part in that song is like so cool you know and, and then yeah. another uh, my B part answer is uh, I first heard There's a Light That Never Goes Out in Spanish um, I heard it from a uh, this guy named Mikel Erensun that my, my mom was a fan of mm-hmm. from northern Spain. He was a singer of this band, Dunk and Do. Right, yeah. And um, he actually, when I was growing up, that was my first um, experience with like listening to that song. So it was really neat to me to um, kind of discover that that was the song I grew up listening to was actually made by this group that I'm starting to get into and I feel like maybe that kind of was like a foreshadowing yeah. of like what I'm doing now because I totally see the duality there like the song sounds dope in Spanish or English right uh, I need to I need to hear a Mexican or a Spanish version of it too yeah it's, it's great yeah dude that sounds that sounds pretty cool so I know that you were also um, just kind of want to get into like a little bit of the the past projects uh, that you were involved in because I know I know you were heavily a, a primary part of like Wild Pack and and I was wondering were you also involved in any other projects like during that time too or like was I it mean, just previously to Wild Pack back in like 2006 2005 um, I was in a band called Minus Radio and our album was produced by Bob Bruno who's in um, Best Coast and the artwork was done by Victor Gastelum who uh also did cover for like Calexico and bands like that oh, right and was Raymond Pettibone's understudy mm-hmm. um, so uh, you know not bad for being a senior in high school and then we got to tour off the coast and we played with like the band Health in Portland and we got to play with Abe Vigoda in Bakersfield and nice um, it was just like being exposed early on like we uh, got to play at the Smell several times when we played with like members of Q and Not You, which is one of my favorite bands, and um, just like I think, at the time you're just doing it, being a kid in high school, like playing, you know, playing a gig, and then you're back at school the next morning, and you don't really tell anyone you're in a band. I don't know, but now in retrospect, I really, really, like I get kind of sappy about it. I really appreciate all those times that I had uh, as a as a young person being exposed at an early age to how like playing shows breaking strings on stage (laughs) like just driving around all of those little things that nuances that eventually just become second nature and now i can be on the road without a care in the world i know what we need to do yeah especially like since you were already exposed in that tour life so early on like yeah i mean i was i think i'm consider myself blessed for that and just lucky to have the opportunity so young yeah and you know 10 years later i'm still feeling the same way (laughs) except now much more like conscious about what i'm doing and uh just really trying to push this project yeah do you still keep in touch with your old band members from back then too uh yeah i mean considering that band i I live with one of them (laughs) So again, oh really? Okay. It's safe yeah. to say we're still friends. That's good. And then the other guy moved. He lives in Oakland. Gerardo uh, Gonzalez, the drummer. Um, he's in a cool band right now named 1988 up in Oakland. Nice. And um, yeah, I mean, I, every time I'm in Oakland, he's one of the first people I call. And vice versa, every when he's down here in, in LA. Oh wow! Well, it's good that you you still have that connection going on, you know. And I was so I looked into some of the music that you have on um like you know just some of the music videos that you got like and like one of the first thing i saw was the uh for it was a video for two esquina and i think it's really impressive how you could how you can also write songs in spanish and uh just kind of wondering like do you have like a like a preferred language in songwriting or does it just like naturally come out like do you have like a like a head language like where it's like whenever you think you think in spanish or um, you think in english at times I mean, I think in my head, I'm thinking mostly in English, but definitely can transfer to Spanish easily, but I don't have a, like a biased because 
it's more imp- the melody is more important in the song yeah and yeah, if yeah. it bounces in a certain way um like a syllable wise uh in spanish in a certain way that is distinctive and sounds better than the english for example yeah then i'll go that route yeah, but it yeah, could yeah. also go vice versa and um honestly it's maybe just like um, the way i started writing the poem or the lyrics um um you know if i if i need lyrics that have a certain feeling maybe i'll go towards my some of the songs i wrote in spanish because maybe that's going to get my feeling across more that song yeah but it's a real song by song thing and i don't really have a favorite if anything i'm trying to expand to other languages okay. i have one song on my new record that's in catalan and that was just an experiment but i would like to write more in that language and i'd like to experiment with like maybe even like italian or um even like portuguese you know? portuguese yeah definitely they're they're definitely like similar to spanish but like some like different nuances right i mean right. Like, as you like write right through and so yeah yeah no it's it must be a challenge but like i i definitely look up to a lot of those artists who could do it like bilingually and plus like you said that you're willing to do it like in like a completely different like language too so <laughs> yeah i grew up as spanish my first language and and english came around like when i was five or six okay but um it's singing in spanish was right under my nose my whole life because i knew spanish mm-hmm um, I just kind of like approached music in an American like English format initially in my life and just because you know that's what me and all my friends were into right but w- it was just like the most under you know when they say like the answer is right under your nose like once I was realized that I can easily just transfer this over to Spanish like how come I never thought of that before yeah and it just opened the floodgates to like myself really because within that realization you start to realize your own identity and become proud of that identity and Mm -hmm. realize the kind of person that i am and which is a bilingual person and to take honor in that and to really like hone that in and and take it in as your own like that's what artist is being all about and learning about yourself and and just being really comfortable in your own shoes and also you know stepping in the water like like david bowie said and and um also putting yourself out of your comfort zone yeah because that's important too that's so funny for me. damn it's crazy i so i listened to um so i also got into your music on um, through porch party records on um the the album delay cadaver of a day you know that's because that was like the last project you released last year and um i thought i thought it was like a really groovy project and i noticed that you like putting in like a good amount of instrumental and like a really uh cool transitions like you know in between songs you know and i was wondering like do a lot of these like sound and like a lot of these instrumental stuff that you uh hone in on these project do do these like influence come from like your uh, love for prog music um uh, that's a fair question because i think that delay cadaver a day is um maybe me my last real proggy album oh really because i mean like yeah i've definitely there's no high there's especially in that record there's no hiding like the influence of like the proggy aspect of rock um in the sense like just splicing things together and kind of like jumping from theme to theme and that's always been a part of my musical style but we recorded those songs like three years ago Uh, so um it really is almost like it was a snapshot of who we were at the beginning of the Rudy Day and the band mm. and um, I definitely like enjoy making songs like that but um, I think um, one of my biggest uh, challenges now is to move forward and to show our fans and people that follow us and new people that you know what they heard on delay is just not gonna be what they're gonna hear now because uh, okay. our, we just like embarking on a new sound and i'm really excited about it i feel like we finally found something a little closer to home to who i really am what kind of shift uh were you were you doing for this like new project i mean it's like a very soulful and very much more groovy and laid back and romantic Ah, and more straight to the point I see. And a lot more songs in Spanish because if you really notice on delay, there was no songs in Spanish. And right. that was only a coincidence. Yeah. But with that coincidence, we actually took 
um, to heart this one this project to like purposefully like really focus on the Spanish music that we have and make that a big theme of the record and uh, it sounds you know we always nothing but old mics and guitars and drums and um, all analog gear straight to reels and we really like I have a really soft spot for like you know like 60s sounding tones yeah yeah and stuff like that so it's really like um it's almost like a whole nother band really right yeah yeah but so i think that we can expand on this sound a lot more okay yeah so most of the songs are like pretty much like in spanish there's it's definitely some in english too okay yeah. but just the way that this album panned out the spanish songs definitely over like outnumber the english ones i see so the so the new project is pretty much like completed you say oh or? it's done yeah but um we are uh, sitting on it um still writing new material and it's very you know talking about it on a podcast like this is almost like spilling the beans in a way because <laughs> uh we do have a new record but we just are waiting and it's like we're keeping a big secret from people and we do plan on s releasing two songs this summer okay. on a lathe cut, uh, 25 copies on lathe cut for Jazz Cats Records. And again, no one who hasn't heard this podcast yet has really knows that because we haven't really announced it yet. Um, but we are going to be doing that this summer to help uh, expose our new sound and show it to, new, to people what we we're doing now. Cause I think people need an introduction, new introduction. It's yeah. almost like we're starting fresh. Ah, I see. You know. Yeah. So, so when you like, especially because I, because like in the past too, like when I like interview like different bands in the podcast, like they totally like cut cut out their like old sound and they're like, all right, this is like our new new shit and like we're gonna go with it, you know. And I was wondering, like, since you're since you were saying that this is gonna be like a new refreshed uh, Rudy Day and the band, like. Do you think like most of the material that you're going to be performing live is going to be something of this new oh, album? Yeah, like ninety percent of the music we're playing now and at any show is all new material. We pick a few of our old songs, but I think um, we still haven't, you know, we still haven't hit our stride, and we're still trying to seek out the best new material we can possibly play for people. So I've always been, if people know, like if people come to our shows, they know that half the time I'm trying to experiment and play new material but you're catching it at its freshest you know rawest point and I would be excited you know to see that if I was a fan of a band no definitely yeah and I I think so too but uh, I I do want to like mention uh, one of my favorite track on the delay album which is a uh, house of construction and because it has this like really I don't know, it has this really cool post-punk kind of feel to it, you know, like, maybe it comes from your influence of the Smiths or not, but um, I was wondering, like, how did you get into creating that song, um, if you remember? Well, you know, um, the, the title of that song is a direct, like, but indirect, like, I love doing those, you know, like, homage to Bauhaus, because yeah. uh, that's just the translation of of what that word means is just a house of construction like right. somewhere where you can uh, manufacture something so or produce something so that in itself was already like kind of a clue that this song is a little more like industrial or like dark sounding yeah in my head that's how i heard it and lily was toying around with that bass line and i was like keep playing that part over and over again until we came up with a you know a song built around it and um i th i can cite like sonic youth and the entrance band also as like influences on the first section of the song mm -hmm. but then on the second part of the song i feel like i rarely seldomly like kind of visit like that kind of like i would dare say like almost like emo sound but uh we kind of toy around with like uh, I don't know maybe like if like Sunny Day Real Estate was a high, faster tempo band or something right but we we're just toying around with little ideas and I think it came together to be a, an interesting little song that seems to be one of the songs that catches more people's attention the most yeah I, it definitely caught my attention as we as I was listening to it because it was kind of like um it was very outside of the box within the track list I don't know like it and it was like whoa like this is something that's 
And again, yeah. um, okay. now when we play that song live, there's a part in that song where we completely changed already. Oh, so really? So th there's a section that sounds nothing like the record anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's going to be, you know, that's really exciting to hear because especially like seeing a live band and if they do things like differently, then, you know, there's like a more excitement behind that, you know? Right. But I was wondering like, because, you know, just like we were talking about how you're going to be playing with like Matt Costa like sometimes this month. You know, I was looking through, like, some of the bills that, like, you know, you were in in the past. Like, because I know you played in Music Tastes Good and stuff. But one thing that really stuck out to me was that you played a show with L1011. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was wondering, like, what was that like? Because that, um, that's actually one of my uh, favorite bands, so. Um, you know, I just turned out that uh, they were coming to town and they were seeking out a local band. And we were just uh, suggested to be the band, even though... You know, we might not have a, that much of a similar sound, but I think that one thing that is a similarity is like, just like noodly, like kind of like semi complex guitar work, like kind of like guitar driven music, mm -hmm. where I think their fans could appreciate us. And, uh, you know, all it takes is a recommendation sometimes, man, where like it's kind of, and then uh, turns out we had a personal. Um, contact with the drummer and you know we met beforehand and oh. he really wanted to help us get on this bill and um, you know I brought like sangria I brought my, made my own homemade sangria <laughs> I cut oranges and like a couple of other fruits and we had our I garnished them with mint and in the green room we had a little sangria party <laughs> that, was, that was pretty fun. That sounds dope. So you know, we make make the best of it, and one of you know, one of the biggest like most satisfying things about playing music is just being able to share the bill with like musicians who you just know that they're on another caliber, and they're you know it's just always an honor to play with cool bands like that, and to yeah. be able to host them in my own town is that much more of an honor like when we played with the dodos at alex's bar it was pretty sweet wow oh wow i and didn't like know they played they, you know like i feel like we're kind of an ambassador band in that sense like we've hosted la luz we've hosted bass drum of death we've hosted mild high club all in long beach and i'm proud to be able to be the band that helps bring those types of bands to Long Beach because yeah. I don't know if that's like always happens yeah that's true I mean especially like it, you're kind of like the guy who's like welcoming them into the city and you know kind of I mean yeah at least the it, bands yeah. that I like are like the music I'm trying to push yeah. but again you know I would like to like take that back a little bit because it's cool to host bands here but my biggest thing is to not be stuck in Long Beach right and like if and when I am stuck in Long Beach it's because we're playing with cool bands from out of town but other than that we like to be, stay actively outside of LA County even for that matter or Orange County and just go to states and like for instance we're going to Baja California for two dates right in August so nice. we like to like keep it unlocal as po much as possible right yeah you want to be able to like expand like yeah, even we're, more we're plotting a tour to Japan in January no way and, um, that's awesome um, you know stuff like that so um yeah wow a, a tour to Japan that's pretty cool dude yeah I mean I feel like that's one of the most like highly rated in my opinion uh, places to go on tour at, and I always felt like Japanese people really appreciate music and on top of that weird music like music that's kind of like not exactly uh, you know straightforward a little more off kilter <laughs> and um, yeah. um, there's a lot of variety over there but I think that we could fit right in and find our little pocket nah. and we have some people that are going to help us get that together oh, that's amazing dude yeah I was wondering um, because since because based on like from what I hear like you've been doing this for like a long time like ever since you were in like high school and you've been touring and making music constantly and I was wondering do you have any like advice for like people like especially if they want to like get into a similar thing that you are doing like you know making bands and like touring and stuff like you know, based on your um, experience of being with Wild Pack or like or being like a solo artist I can only say that I can't tell people what to do or how to do it but I can only speak from my own experience 
and say that I've just 100% given myself completely to music and the lifestyle that it entails which means like you know living paycheck to paycheck and for now but it's all like for like a greater cause to hopefully not have to do that one day Mm -hmm. but I mean I feel like if you don't love it you're not gonna stick it out this long I really don't know what else I would be doing Um, I could go to a trade college and get acquire a degree of some sort or go and roll back to Cal State Long Beach but um, I just uh, all I can say is like your passion has to be there and your heart has to be in it and it's not always going to be all flowers and roses you know we've had some pretty amazing moments like playing a sold out show with Chicano Batman at the El Rey and like in front of over 900 people but we wouldn't have you know gotten to moments like that if it wasn't for all the hardships and struggles and some people you know might have it a little easier but I guess it's just a real test of your will and I think people will know right away whether this is for them or not right and I feel like I didn't pick music it picked me and I'm just kind of I feel like I'm just kind of a vessel for something else channeling through me sometimes yeah and I'm just kind of there yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you seem seems like you know you pretty much know it, you know, based on like you know what you're doing continuously. So you know, that yeah, I just gotta like really commit to something. I just commit to the idea that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, and I live it that way every single day of my life. But right. sometimes, like I said, you know, it's not always clear cut and easy, and you do have to work side jobs and make rent and that's just the reality of life Mm -hmm. but those types of things could easily bring you down and deter you away from pursuing music but I've chosen to not let stuff like that bother me and uh, just stay driven and stay focused yeah to not be discouraged yeah Yeah. I think it's easy to be discouraged so easy but I think you know you're the real badass when you don't let things like that affect you and you can overcome it and you know come on top of it yeah to not be swayed by anything and you know just just keep on doing what you love to do you know it's amazing i was one this is a this is a question that i ask on the podcast episode um for every artist but um uh, i was wondering uh what what was um what was one of the uh the best band or artist that you've seen live and this is um you could include both DIY or even like a venue show if you want to, because because as a musician, like we're both uh, players and also audience too. So totally. Can, yeah, yeah. So I was wondering um, what your take were. Well, I guess uh, off the top of my head, uh, I think seeing Unknown Mortal Orchestra live in two thousand eleven um, was a really big deal for me. Even though I was already had seen a, a thousand bands at that point, but just to see a band so fluid and clean and really weird at the same time, um, just kind of exp- to- made me feel like I needed to go home and practice. I like the bands that make me feel like I need to go back to the drawing board and practice and get my shit together. Felt that way before too. Because <laughs> um, those are the bands that are pushing, and um, you know. They're making you feel that way. Like I can't deny it when a band makes me feel like that. Um, you know. Where do you Where do you see him at? That was like I when, s- when you say 2011. That was like before. Like they s- got like pretty big. Yeah, I saw them at this place in Santa Monica uh, with this little like hundred person club. I forget. We played there before once or twice too. So that was neat to see them on the same stage and hear them sound the way they did and kind of realizing wow like it's not like the stage you're playing on it's it's all right yeah. it's all you but um uh let's see i also saw john Frusciante flea and omar do a set together on their own once and playing original music along um like 10 years ago right uh, over 10 years ago and that was really neat to see in such an intimate environment yeah um diy um, just like not even DIY but 
I have the honor to be friends with one of my favorite acts in the world is Yonatan Gott uh, from New York. He's actually originally from Israel, wow. but he has a three-piece band. And um, honestly, Yonatan Gott is probably one of the hands down like the top ten live acts in the world. Oh, okay. Uh, just uh, um, it's an experience more than just watching a set, and that's really what makes music. It takes music to that next level. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. They almost made me cry the last time I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> do they? Do they come down here? You said um, New York. They, yeah, they tour a lot. Last time I I booked them a show at Fourth Street Vine actually, and it was pretty intense. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what, so, kind, what kind of music is it? I uh, like psychedelic, like guitar driven, like improvisational, like psyche jazz, like but fusion because it's like the drums could be pretty like punky and like just kind of like uh very frantic sounding music but then they could just like turn into something really pretty or something very ominous right um it's like very free-flowing type of music damn yeah no i'll I'll definitely have to check it out yeah now before um i you know i think i i think i pretty much asked like everything that i wanted to ask but um before i wrap this up what I do at the end of the podcast is I play, um, I play the, uh, one of the the artist's music, and I was wondering like if there's anything from. Let's, I know I know you're currently working on a new stuff, so like we're not gonna like release anything like from there or anything like that, you know. But like if there's anything from like a, uh, your last record, a delay that you want to like play on there, like I was wondering like, would yeah. you like to choose a song? Yeah. It would be cool if you played White Skies. White Skies? Yeah. Is that your favorite track on the album? Um, maybe. I, I really don't have one. But I think that's just kind of like... I miss playing that song live, so... Okay. Maybe that's why. I just want to hear it or have it be heard. Okay. Because it's going to eventually be one of those songs that just gets, like, you know, in the dust. Yeah, yeah. But give it some shine. Let's do it, then. <laughs> All right, well, Rudy, thank you so much for being a part of this oh yeah and, man totally yeah Matt only met you last week but like you know, to be able to do this is like pretty awesome so oh yeah thank you for wanting to <laughs> yeah thanks a lot that was like the conclusion of a really I don't know, productive day yeah <laughs>
that was Rudy DeAnda. If you want to listen to more of Rudy's music, I included his Bandcamp link in the description box. He has some shows coming up too, so if you're interested, I highly encourage you to follow his social media, which I also included in the description box. More podcast episodes are coming, so don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. My name is Kazu, and I'll see you next time on one and only Large K Podcast. Peace. Thank you.